December 23rd. Kretkoker. Do you see them? Ulf whispered, half gasping as he got to his feet. No, but that hardly means anything. Ulf joined me near the door and looked out into the yard. The snow blew and the wind howled, December in full force raging outside. The trees creaked in the blow, but I was surprised to see not a single footprint in the fresh powder. Small as they were, they should have left some sign of their passing. Ulf bit his lip, just as confused as I was, and when he looked back to me, I could see the uncertainty written across his face. I don't like it. It feels wrong. Why did they just stop? I don't know, but I agree. Something is fishy here. We took some boards and used them to hold the mattress in place, the wind blowing against the house outside and making it groan. The house seemed to sag under the weight of all the silence, the snow creaking on the roof, the wind pushing at the walls. Ulf and I listened for even the slightest sound of lads, but it was as if they had evaporated. We had gone from defending our door with a mattress, knives hitting the springs again and again, to total silence in the course of a few minutes. Should we... should we maybe make a break for it? Ulf asked, the silence rattling him as much as it had me. What if that's their plan, I whispered. What if they want us to think that it's clear, so we'll give up our position of strength? So what? We just stay here till morning? Ulf asked, skeptically. Seems the best course of action. Ulf took a seat on the couch, but it didn't seem to comfort him. His eyes kept straying to the window, the idea of the lad's eyes watching him, making him uncomfortable. I couldn't blame him. Picking my way towards the kitchen... I couldn't help but watch the windows as I made tea. Tea seemed about the only thing I had left in the house, aside from some TV dinners, and it helped calm me down and keep me awake on these long nights. I found myself glancing up at the window every few seconds, wishing I had covered them or something. I expected them to burst open any minute, the lads rolling in on me as they took their terrible revenge, but the waiting was almost worse, despite there being nothing we could do about it. So we waited. It would be hours until dawn. Icelandic sun cycles can put sunrise at 11 a.m. during winter, but that's never seemed to matter to the lads. They had always seemed to leave around morning time, and could appear any time after the sun went down. They didn't seem to have any particular arrival schedule, but I suspected that their departure time was due to children. The Yule lads had always dealt mostly with the schedules of children, you see leaving gifts and making mischief while the kids were asleep, and it seemed that their antics ended when a child would normally be awake. It didn't seem as hard and fast a rule where I was concerned. They were out for revenge, after all. But something about the true night gave them a sense of power. If we could hold out until morning, we might be okay. We sat near the door with our tea, neither of us feeling comfortable in the living room. Our adrenaline was racing, and our ears were cocked for any sound of approaching elf feet. I was listening for the familiar tap of boots on the floor, the scrape of Patrasfell in his wooden armor, the sniffle of Gettelfur. I heard something now and then, a rustle or a groan from the ceiling outside the room, but with the wind and the snow, it could easily have been the eaves creaking under the weight. I dug in, expecting to be attacked at any minute, but the adrenaline was making Ulf twitchy. Ulf's eyes darted around like a trapped cat, and he seemed in danger of breaking the handle on his axe if he twisted it much harder. I could understand his discomfort. This would be like a murderous Father Christmas coming down the chimney with an axe for me, but it seemed to make him progressively more upset the longer the silence stretched. He was a farmer, a sheep herder. Fighting creatures of fey was not something he was supposed to be doing. Hell, it wasn't something any of us were supposed to be doing. As the hours ticked by, Ulf began to slip into madness. At 2 a.m., he looked up suddenly, looking out into the hall. We had moved into the bedroom, the lack of windows making us feel a little safer as we guarded Sausage Snatcher. He was snorting softly, grunting every now and again, but he seemed to understand that our time with him was limited. He was uncomfortable, but he would be freed soon, one way or another. Even with all the anxiety and adrenaline pumping through me, 
I found myself nodding as I listened to the little creature snoring. Ulf, however, seemed immune to all the snoring spells. He started at the door like he wanted to set it on fire, and when he jumped up, I snorted awake violently. Did, did you hear something? I whispered, gripping my bat tightly. I... I need something to drink. I blinked at him in surprise. Now? What if they're still out there? I'll take my chances. I can't sit here another minute and listen to this house creak. I'll go good and truly insane if I do. He went through the door slowly and carefully, and I jumped up to try and stop him. Ulf, wait! He was in the hall already, though, slipping along quietly as he tried to look in four directions at once. I stopped at the door, my feet refusing to go any further, my body trapped in limbo as I watched Ulf peek around into the living room. He looked to the kitchen, looked to the fireplace, but when he looked to the front door, I saw him linger there. The mattress was gone, simply disappeared, and the door hung open as the snow became small hills on the hay. Ulf had the decency to look remorsefully at me before making a break for the front door. That's when I heard him gag and watched his body come up short as he came even with the couch. That galvanized me, and I ran from the room to try to help him. He just stood there amidst the hay and the ruins of my traps, looking like a fish on a hook for all intents and purposes. It would prove to be a fitting analogy. As I came closer, I realized that stand was the wrong word. Ulf's feet were twitching, his toes jumping on the floor like he was having a fit. His arms jerked like he was in shock, and I realized what he looked like a moment before I saw the thread. They should have been visible. I should have been able to see the hundreds of translucent strands that hung from the ceiling, each ending in a silvery hook with a brutal tip. He had been pierced over a dozen times, maybe even two dozen, and they stuck into him like bee stingers. He shook a little as the blood oozed down his front, and when he turned, I could see that a few of them had found their way into his face. His features were a rictus of pain, and I thought Ulf looked like a puppet who's just noticed his strings. When he was jerked into the rafters, the axe spilling from his fingers to clunk to the floor, I heard the lads giggling and knew we had been tricked. I looked up into the shadows, wanting to help him, but I couldn't think of any way to get up there to him. I could see all the hooks around me, my eyes finally seeing them now that I was aware of them, and as their boots thunked above me, I ran back to the hallway so they couldn't simply fall on my head. The basket I'd slung under my arm, my constant albatross, began to shake violently, and I almost dropped it as the little creature tried to take advantage of my distraction. I couldn't fight them, and keep hold of Sausage Snatcher, and I feared that if I let him escape, I'd never see Ulf again. I hated myself for being a coward, but the only way to help Ulf was to stay alive. I ran back to the bedroom and braced the door, the wood little more than Swiss cheese now, and the stacked furniture, keeping out anything that might try to stab its way through. I took the basket, its inhabitant laughing maniacally, and got into the farthest corner I could. I couldn't help Ulf, he was with the lads now, but if I could hold on to this little goblin, maybe I could still get him back. The laughter from the wicker prison was making me crazy, and I kicked out at him as I put my head against my knees and tried not to lose my mind. Watching, watching my best friend get pierced with hooks and dragged into the rafters wasn't great for my mental health. As the minutes passed and my breathing reached something like normal, I decided it was time to go bargain. I walked out into the hall, basket under my arm, and called out to them. This has gone on long enough. I'm ready to make a deal, but only if my friend is still alive. As if they'd been waiting for me, there was a note hanging from one of the hooks, written in perfect English in an immaculate hand. Meet us by the scorched tree at midnight. Come alone, or your friend stays with us. Regards, Keta Snicker. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's story, and I hope you're enjoying the Yule Lads Diaries. Tonight, we met what I consider one of the more devious lads, at least once I put my dark coating on him. 
called Ketkronker, or Meat Hook. He uses his meat hook to snatch up meat left out, especially smoked lamb. As you can see in tonight's story, he's used his meat hooks for something a little different, I think. For, I mean, with his size, what's a fish hook but a meat hook to this fellow? It seems that tonight was a bit of a twofer as well. We've actually met the lad that'll make up our final story, but I'll talk about Candle Beggar tomorrow. He's possibly the lad I've taken the most liberties with, but I think you'll like him anyway. If you're just joining us for our Yule Lad stories and you're a little behind, I'd suggest going to the Yule Lads playlist. It's got all of our Yule Lad stories, so you can get good and caught up before tomorrow night's night 13. Tomorrow night will be the last official night, but there may be a little bit more. Who knows? If you're working on some last minute wrapping, or just trying to figure out how to wrap those pesky in-laws in a carpet before garbage day, might I suggest my holiday playlist. It's the perfect background for anything you might be doing. Tonight's suggestion is New Year, New Me. Who amongst us hasn't made a hasty New Year's resolution? Maybe we're not happy with the way we are. Maybe we're not happy with who we are. And we decide that maybe this is the year we change ourselves. Well, the OP in this story certainly changed himself, but perhaps not necessarily for his betterment. If you'd like my words in print for the stories on that playlist, come on down to Amazon. I've got a link below you can get my latest book, Fall Frights and Winter Chills, just the thing for any horror fan on your Christmas list. Though, I dare say they probably won't get it till the new year this time. If you'd like a signed copy, Get in touch with me. I'm sure I can make that happen for you. And if you're a fan of signed copies, might I suggest you come on down to Patreon. For only $10 a month, you can join my ghostly reader tier and get a signed copy of my book anytime I write one, which is usually about twice a year. Speaking of my amazing patrons, let's go ahead and thank them, shall we? Thanks to Janet for being our spooky skeleton tier contributor. And thanks to Winter, Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Martha, Marianne Schuler, Jennifer Damron, and Tyler Parker for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening and a spooky holiday season. <laughs>